Hey everyone, welcome to Gourd Views. We've got so much to roll out over the course of this year for the audience. I mean, right now our focus is, is trying to motivate the local community to fulfill its destiny. And we believe that destiny is saving the planet. And that sounds big and it sounds over the top. Now, I realize that it sounds that way. But we spent so much time thinking through so many things. I equate it to a maze, right? I mean, you're kind of trying to solve the challenges of a community. It's, it's a lot like a maze. You go, you start the start point where you are now, trying to get to this place where you want to be, and oh, there's a yeah, there's a block, so I gotta back up and go this. Nope, that's the wrong way too. So back all the way up to okay here. I can go further this way up. Still a block, and you just keep going until you find that place. And that's you know that in a nutshell, that's like a great metaphor for the process that um, I've been going through for frankly years. But the last year has been been far more intense, far more in depth because started getting closer to the goal, started seeing the goal, I'd say, all right, I've overcome all these past hurdles. So how to do that? Well, in this video, we're going to share some magic. That's right, magic, right? The magic of wow. Hopefully you said, wow, what? Yes. Um, Wow is an interesting word. Wow in itself is magical. I began my career in 1980, my military career in 1989, as a linguist. And, and you know, in addition to studying a bunch of other foreign languages, like I actually studied Russian and German. That's painful. I'll just put it that way. Painful. Um, and it would be virtually impossible if. I hadn't already studied linguistics because linguistics helps you understand how languages work, right? You start to see languages as more universal and not so different when you understand linguistics and how humans, you know, there's all these different things that are common, like time. How do you express time? You know, the difference between past tense and past perfect tense, right? So a lot of you are like, oh, who cares? Well, it matters and it, it trains your brain to think about things a little differently. And that's why I think about the word wow a little differently. The word wow, do you realize that the word wow, every single language has 100 different words for the word wow. And the word wow, all 100 different uses or more um, for wow are spelled exactly the same, are actually the same word but yet means something different and the same at the same time. Wow. That's, that's wowing. You know, when you like, now some of you are probably saying, wow, I really never thought of it that way. Some of you might be saying, what? All right. So that's okay. If you said what, like if you're not grasping this wowing concept of the word, wow, that I'm trying to express, let me back it up, back it up. It's good. Like in communication theory, Communication isn't effective if you're not taking from the abstract to the concrete or from the concrete to the abstract, All right? Sometimes the receiver of a message is able to bridge the gap between those two things themselves. Sometimes it's incumbent upon the conveyor of the information to do that for the receiver, particularly like in learning situations. All right, sometimes it's just different shared experiences are different and so you don't grasp or see things the same way. You attach a slightly different nuanced meaning to a particular word, which is kind of the magic of wow, because we all do that, like in our expression of it and our receipt of it. So let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. Using Niagara Falls. When a person first sees that waterfall for the first time as they approach it, as they get there, they look at it. And if they're an English speaker, they say, wow. And then they might glance over at Canada and, and see that 
newly developed, more modern city with its tall, high-rise hotels and the towers and the Ferris wheel. And if it's night, all the lighted glitz, Vegas-like glitz. And when they glance over at that, they might go, wow. Or, you know, particularly in the springtime, when all the flowers are blooming, they might look around our, our manicured landscape park and go, wow. Or they might step outside our park and, and look at the the artifacts of the industrial era and it doesn't quite meet their expectation of a city that's a custodian of such a natural wonder and go, wow. All right, I just used wow four times. All four times I was kind of expressing the same thing. Yet, wow also meant something different in all four of those episodes. Now that's if you're an English speaker. I said in all languages. So, like, if I were a Spanish speaker and and never watched any American television, so wow is not a word, a phonetic in my vocabulary, I would probably, it would probably go something like this. I walk up to the waterfall, I'm like, increíble. And then I look at Canada, I'm like, increíble. I look at the manicured landscape and the flowers and the pristine crispness of, of man's influence on nature within the park itself and say, increíble, right? And I walk outside of the park and, you know, maybe see the blight that I wasn't expecting to see and say, increíble. Same thing, same thing just happened in a different language, right? It's the same, same word used for times it's spelled the same it's pronounced the same it's the same word as expressing the same thing as wow was expressing in english but yet it's used differently to mean something different yet the same at the same time wow is it is it a, a magical word i mean i think it is i mean if you don't think it is then i mean i think you're dead inside i mean it, it's 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 wowing to me when i think about wow that way and more magical and more wowing is how I just used it in the context of Niagara Falls to explain it so easily. I can't do that in another location, right? I mean, I can go to New York City and I can see the Statue of Liberty. And I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, I've seen the Statue of Liberty. But I don't just glance around it and, and get wowed by its surroundings, right? I don't make these comparisons. I might go to the Grand Canyon and look at that and go, fucking wow. Things deep, kind of big. That's it. I don't like look past it and get wild by anything else around it. You know, I mean, maybe if I'm there during a bird migration, because birds bring their own magic, and I'm, you know, looking down on a dozen different birds of prey soaring by me, or like a condor, and like those things are monsters, I'm looking down on it, that might be wowing. Um, but the, I mean, that would have to be a unique experience, and that would happen right here in Niagara Falls, too, and along the gorge. I mean, I can show you some really amazing hawk photos that I've taken looking down on the hawk as it's flying. So it's not, you know, that's not unique to the Grand Canyon. It's not a magical thing about the Grand Canyon, and, and the wow aspect of the Grand Canyon, frankly, is a, a very narrow wow. But in Niagara Falls, humanity is wowed by it. And if you don't understand the uniqueness of this location, that characteristic, how magical that is, then you know, I'm not going to be able to help you. And, and you're not going to be able to help us or yourself in this mission to fulfill our destiny as a location, as a custodians of Earth's most magical place, for that matter. Like, I mean, you could be wild by the Amazon forest. But not in the same way. I've not quite been in the... I haven't been that deep. I've been in the Amazon itself. But I've been in the jungles of South America. Um, and, and it's impressive. I mean, the, the, the animals. Like, if you see the Kundamunde... I mean, if you ever heard of a Kundamunde... I mean, it's just a weird word to even say, Kundamunde. Um, it, it's, it's like a cross between a monkey, a raccoon, and a something else. Like, it's like aliens dropped off their pet... And it's just roaming around the South American jungles. Um, or if you heard a sloth screech, like looking at a sloth is not wowing. You just look at the salmon like, 
how the fuck have you survived millennia? Like, why do you even exist? Right? But then when you hear it, its, its defense mechanism is this blood-curdling screech that makes you feel deep in your soul that a pterodactyl is about to eat you for lunch. Like, then you can see the fucking sloth and like, you're over the fear in seconds. Like, why did I even feel that way? Because I didn't know that was a sloth making the noise. Um, all I'm trying to convey right now is like, you have to really understand as a Niagara Falls person what this location means to the rest of the planet, to the rest of humanity. I mean, it means a lot to the rest of the planet, too, even if you're not human. It means a lot. Wow. All right. So, I mean, hopefully most of you get what I'm saying. Most of you are following along with me. But in case I haven't brought the entire audience along, let me kind of demonstrate the magic of the wow for Niagara Falls from a different perspective. Because right? I talked about a person when they see it for the first time and the effect it has on them. Right? And I know it's true. One, I you know, go down to the waterfall a lot. Two, uh, you know, for the last eight years, most years, I've you know, face-to-face talked to well over 2,000 tourists each year after they visited Waterfall and, and gotten their reactions. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's one of the joys, it's one of the rewards, the intangible rewards of being in the tourist industry here and, and hosting people and, and getting to see that in their face every day. They, they're excited to, like, just talk about it. And sometimes they don't have words. Sometimes they have a lot of words. Um, it's so fucking cool. Um, and, you know, I feel sorry if, if, if you don't get it. I feel sorry if you haven't experienced it, if you don't see it. And I want you to see it. I want you to feel it. Because as a community, we have to feel it. All right? It, it, it needs to exude from us. But so, from a different perspective. All right? Um, obviously, I've traveled the world. I've been to a lot of places. And one of, you know, the craziest places I've been is Timbuktu. Like, and if you didn't know, that's it's a city in Africa. You might have heard the expression, I'm lost in Timbuktu, right? And I always heard that expression growing up. I probably used it a few times. And then one day, you know, I get told, I was captain at the time, Captain Flack, we need you to go to Timbuktu. I'm like looking like, are they kicking me out of the army? Like, what, what the fuck? What do you mean you need me to go to Timbuktu? It's like, like crazy. Yeah, and then, of course, I learned it's a city in Mali, and there's issues there, and, you know, you need to go, and you need to help fix those issues. And then, you know, I found myself in Timbuktu. And this happens all over the world. It happened my entire life journey in the planet, but it just seemed much more impressive when it happened in Timbuktu. You know, you, you meet the natives, you meet the locals, right? And obviously, you know where they're from. And they ask you, like, where are you from? You know, and one American will say, New York City, and their reaction is like, oh, cool. Yeah. And, and it's pretty universal for New York City, but, it, you know, it's the like same expression if they say some other major U.S. city that they're aware of. Like, I'm from Miami. Oh, cool. You know, I'm from San Francisco. Oh, cool. You know. Say you're from Niagara. Or, okay, and so the other extreme is, like, saying you're from Madison, Wisconsin. Right? Then, then the reaction is like, where? Universally. Where? They've, they've never heard of Madison, Wisconsin. You know, they have no concept of where that is, right? And so then, of course, the person from Madison has to say something like, uh, well, it's near the middle up north by Canada. Oh, that's a reaction. Oh, where? Oh, right. Or cool. And that's, that's kind of just how the rest of the world reacts to Americans when Americans say where specifically they're from. Unless you say Niagara Falls. When I say I'm from Niagara Falls, and I never, like, I'm wearing a Buffalo sweatshirt today. My daughter goes to UB. It's a little gift, and it's a fucking freezing today. And so there's nothing more cozy than a hoodie in January, especially one given to you in love, right? Um, now, 
when I tell Americans where I'm from elsewhere in America, I, I actually say Buffalo because they don't really seem to think know where Niagara Falls is and or to think it's in Canada these days. It's a whole other story. But tell someone elsewhere on the planet you're from Niagara Falls. The reaction. Can you guess what the reaction is? Can you guess? I've kind of alluded to what the reaction is. They use the same word in whatever language they speak. Wow! They're wowed by it. They are so wowed by it. Um, and that's amazing, right? I mean, and that's that's what they say after a while. They're like, that's amazing. Like, why did you leave? Can you take me back with you? Right? I mean, is that when you say you're from New York City or Miami or something like that? I'm like, oh, it's cool. I'd like to visit you. Right? You say you're from Niagara Falls. They want to go back with you. Like that. Like, oh, I'll visit you sometime if I'm ever there. Like, they want to go. Right? That's what you have to understand about where we live. You know, in the human consciousness on the planet, it is like the pyramids, right? No one know, no one remembers specifically when they learned a night. They might remember a day in school where it, like, it was brought up as a topic of discussion, but they're pretty sure they were aware of his existence before that day in class. Right? Just like the pyramids. Like, can you remember when you first learned about the pyramids? I can't. You know, you might remember specifically in the third grade, it came up in history course, and, and you had to make a pair, and you had to write a paper on it. But you already knew the pyramids existed before that for somehow, some way. Niagara Falls is that way, right? There aren't other places on the planet quite like that, right? That's a powerful, magical thing. And if you can't understand it, fuck, I don't know what you can't understand. And the fact that we've kind of lost sight of this locally, the fact that we don't appreciate this as much as the rest of the planet does locally, is part of the problem. Um, and why is that? Another weird thing, locally, is um, how the closer you get to Niagara Falls, the less wowing it is to say you are from Niagara Falls. Like, say you're in North Tonawana and say you're from Niagara Falls. You don't get a wow, do you? You might get some empathy, some sympathy, some pity, you know, buffalo... You know, kind of the same thing. I, for example, just this past Monday, yesterday, I was in the town of Niagara at a nursery, consulting with the owner of the nursery, because I'm making a butterfly garden this year. You know, so I need plants, and I want them to have these plants ready for me when it's time to plant this spring. Like, I want this thing done by Memorial Day. So I'm very motivated, and, you know, all this other research that I've been doing on ecology and stuff motivated me to want to do butterfly garden. But while I'm there, here's a person who knows I'm going to buy plants. They know I'm a customer. You know, they also know there are other nurseries we go to. They know I've done a lot of homework, and it should be on their mind that I'm just as likely to go to the other nursery, giving them a shot here. And they're good. They know what they're doing. You know, and the checking that I thought through various things. You know, like the hardiness zone, the, the climate zone. If you don't know, we're in a zone six. The lower you go in number, the further north you are, the colder it is, and the more likely a plant is to die, obviously. Um, so kudos for them to, to make sure that, you know, I'm thinking through that too, and, and I have. But anyways, the point is, it was pretty obvious that you know, the fact that I'm from Niagara Falls, live in Niagara Falls, and I'm planting a butterfly garden in Niagara Falls in so many ways was noticeably negative in the eyes of this person, you know? And I understand why. And I think all, all of us locally can because of the challenges that we face today because of the loss of industry and, and the economic decline of the city and, frankly, failure to embrace our true destiny as a world leader in ecotourism. Um, so, it's almost, like, why is that there, the lack of wow? I mean, I think I kind of just explained a part of why it's not there, but, you know, is it a curse? Is that magic just not really real? You know, I, I don't think so. I, the magic's real, and the curse might be real, too. I mean, the reasons are real, why it... it the closer you get, the less magical it feels. Because we have to face 
the other aspects of the reality that those in a distant place don't have to, or those who are visiting this place really don't have to suffer. Right? They can just go and appreciate the falls and the park and the river if they want and the natural wonder and go out to the lake if they want um, and, you know, kind of ignore those artifacts of the industrial era. But I want to focus in on the locals and the... what you know, I call, It's a disease. It's a disease. We're infected by disease here. I call it terminal cynicism. You know, maybe it's chronic cynicism, but it, it's frankly killing us. And, I, you know, I get infected by it sometimes, too. You know, I had to defend against it. I had to go take pills for it. You know, um, and I'm aware of it. You know, I look out for it. I defend against it a lot. And, and yet, it still gets me. It still gets me. So we have to get over it. How, how do we fight the terminal cynicism? Um... Well, I'm telling you, one, start embracing our true destiny. The green revolution is coming, and the world wants and expects us to lead it. And it's a burden and a blessing at the same time, you know, to have these high expectations placed on you. you know, it's a burden because, you know, having high expectations means you've got to set an example. You have to succeed. You can't show doubt or weakness, otherwise you're going to be disappointing people. And, you know, when there's high expectations on you and you start disappointing, it, it pulls everything down and, you know, high expectations create pressure, right? I mean, anyone who's ever, like, been involved in a sport and you're on a team that has a chance at the league championship or division championship or state championship, you understand what I'm saying. You know, that's why sports are so valuable to instill in youth because it kind of, you know, gives them an chance to be in a position where there's high expectations of them and to learn how to handle high expectations can't let everyone down i mean frankly that's what a military career is all about you know i mean there's a theory behind combat why do they fight versus flee right i mean it's dangerous your life is totally at risk there are bullets whizzing by you and every instinct in your mind tells you you should get the fuck out of here because you're gonna die but you don't you stay one of the theories is what gives you the psychological toughness to stay is believing the guy next to you will, and that's supported by like watching when it starts to crumble, particularly in like previous warfare where you have these big lines of people and they just keep standing even though the guy next to you just got shot and the guy next to you just got shot, but you keep standing there because the other guys who didn't get shot are still standing there. But once one runs, they all flee, all right? And that expectations kind of operates that way. And so the cynicism is like that fleeing, right? It's that mental collapse. We have mentally collapsed and we got to get over that, right? We got to find our confidence again. And I mean, how do you eat that elephant? One bite at a time, you know? So where are we going to start eating that elephant? We're going to start in the trunk. We're going to start in the ass. We're going to start on the left hind leg. Probably doesn't matter as long as you start just taking it one bite at a time. Now, I think there are more optimal ways than others. I'm not sure I've found the most optimal way. But as I said in the last video, I do believe birds is the right place to start. Now, I talked about the burden side of having high expectations placed on you. But it's a blessing too, right? And you got to understand that. When there's high expectations placed on you, but you're meeting them, right? Those with those high expectations are emotionally invested in you. They want to see you succeed. And as long as you continue instilling confidence in them that you are going to realize your potential, they help you. You know, hey, I think you're going to be the next Einstein. I see you're getting straight A's and you're studying hard. Here's a scholarship. Don't work while you're in college. Here's more money for food, clothing, and shelter. Please just keep studying and realize your potential. I will help you. And then in return, eventually, you can help them by, you know, I don't know, inventing electricity or a faster than light drive, what, whatever. I mean, I hope, you know, so you get what I'm saying, right? They want to help you. 
They want to help you. And as you continue instilling that confidence, they start helping you. Right. So there are some aspects of what's necessary between getting from where we are now to where we should be that require capital that we don't have locally. They're not essential. They're not needed immediately. But they will be helpful and they'll probably be and the sooner we get those, the faster we'll go down this path. And some of it, it, it will, I mean, we can generate the revenue ourselves over time, you know, but we'll have more power to generate more revenue sooner, the sooner we get some of these things that do require capital investment. So what I'm saying is, if we go down this path, we'll get it. Right now, though, we're not instilling much confidence in anyone else. We're not, right? I mean, I mean, I've read probably every single other study done on Niagara Falls in in the last at least twenty five years. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if I've read anything that's pre ninety five or not. But it's interesting. The studies done by like private industry, you know, like a, a developer coming to town doing their own study versus, you know, studies commissioned by the government, they all start off the same. They all pretty much start off with New York State Park's claim of visitation rates that year, all right? Um, the government studies say, you know, New York Park's claims 7 million visitors a year. Therefore, big market invests in us, all right? Um, whereas the private studies say, New York State Park claims 7 million. They didn't say, says, they say claims. We find very little evidence to support that. We've looked around their town. They're not even meeting any remote expectation of their brand. And what is our brand? We'll get into that in future videos more in depth, but what is our brand? Trust me, whatever it is, we're not meeting it. It's probably nature, secret. It's That's our brand. Um, oh, sorry, just got off on a tangent. Bottom line on those private studies is uh, they they explain why they the more they look, the less confidence they had, and therefore they're not investing, right? Which goes to my point. If you don't give them confidence, they're not going to invest. And there's, there's ways, and you're like, it goes back to that chicken and the egg thing I talked about in the last video. Well, if you can't, you can't instill confidence without investment, you can't get investment without instilling confidence. And this one's a little bit more simple. And that's frankly, solving this little dilemma is what helps solve the more challenging dilemma of the investment challenge. What comes first, chicken or the egg? Because frankly, it's our attitudes right? Um, frankly, it's not being kind of front about our challenges, right? We have to admit them. We have to take local responsibility. I mean, you hear, you see it on our Facebook forums and people are talking about the local issues and arguing over them and stuff. People are saying things like, they did this to us. Industry did this. We, we were industry, right? Stop saying that. Stop pretending we weren't the industry, right? We, we were here. We were making a living off of those factories, right? we were buying houses and building houses because of the salary we made working in those factories. We were buying cars. We were putting our kids through college. We were buying vacation homes. We were buying boats. Everything, all right? We were the industry. They weren't the industry. We were. Stop pretending we weren't, all right? They didn't create the brownfields. We did. We were working right there. We were the ones picking up the barrels, putting them on a truck, and shoving them in Love Canal. We were the ones covering it with dirt. It wasn't they. They didn't do it, we did. Own it. Take responsibility. Fix it, move on, right? Because as long as we're sitting there saying they did it, we don't need to take responsibility, and we don't need to fix it. They need to fix it. That's gotta stop. We gotta cease that today, starting today. We've got to own it. We've got to fix it. I'm sorry I'm harping. I want to get back to the magic. The magic of wow. Wow. People understand the wow. 
Defend against the cynicism. All right. Why is Niagara Falls so magical? Understand that. Think about it. Why is it so magical? What does the world expect from us now? What is that expectation? Right? Understand it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use Socratic method here and ask you all these little questions and make you just like think of it differently in a way that you probably haven't thought about it before. Right? And the reason I'm doing it this way is, is to get you out of the box. Right? It, it, and we need some out of the box thinking. Now, I've always said this throughout all my career, and I've done a lot of teaching too, particularly in out of the box thinking. Um, don't forget that you live in the box, right? So when you're thinking outside the box, you can't destroy the box. The box still has to survive the thoughts, right? There is context, but the solution's obviously not found in the box. If it was, it wouldn't be a problem that you need to think about because it was right there for you to grasp and apply. Therefore, you have to think outside the box. The mistake often made is people just, oh, I'm out of the box. Oh, another tangent. All right. But I need you guys to follow along with me. What does the world expect from us? In a word, inspiration. Inspiration. It's that simple. They expect to be inspired. And they are by the waterfall. You know, why is that thing so goddamn inspiring to human beings across the planet? Whether they've seen it or not, they're fucking inspired by it. And sorry for the swearing, but I need it for emphasis. Right? It needs you to viscerally feel these concepts. All right? They need to be part of our DNA locally. They used to be. For sure as shit they were. Right? And you can hear it now in cynicism. Back in the day. And then you hear the inspiration that existed back in the day. Right? The world hasn't lost that inspiration related to Niagara Falls. Only us locals have lost it. Right? Because life got hard. Because life got so easy so quickly with the advent of electricity and the rapid industrialization of the city in the early part of the last century. It got so easy. It felt like we would never fail. We can't do anything wrong. It's just so easy. And now all of a sudden it's so hard. Virtually both things happened overnight. Different nights, of course. Lights got turned on, lights got turned off. In between, when the lights were on, wow, so easy. We started ignoring our waterfall, right? That's what, we ignored the waterfall. Then the lights got turned off, and the only thing left is the roar of the falls. And you're listening to it, and you're like, yeah, why aren't, uh, why is it so crappy here? Why do people keep coming? Because they're inspired. They're seeking inspiration, and they are inspired when they see it inspiration right and then they get here and they get inspired by that and then they talk to one of us and uh punch to the face on that inspiration yeah well you gotta understand it's uh it's not as great as it looks it's kind of depressing there's nothing to do it's a fucking shit ton of things to do right and they didn't come here to party if they wanted to party they would have gone to vegas right if they wanted a playground they would have gone to a playground you know, if they want an adult playground, they go to Vegas. They want a family playground, they go to Orlando. They chose Niagara Falls for a natural playground. And we have it. Stop telling them we don't. Right? The gorge is part of the playground. The entire river is part of the playground. Upper and lower. Hyde Park, frankly, is part of the playground. Reservoir State Park is part of the playground. Golden Hill State Park is part of the playground. The entire lakeshore is part of the playground. It's a huge natural playground. Now, how do you monetize the playground? That's, a, that's something we've got to think through. Um, and maybe you don't really need to monetize the playground. I mean, that's kind of what I said in the last video is we just need people to visit the playground outside of the three months that they're currently visiting the playground. Right, because when they're visiting those three months, I mean, it's it's great. Like economically, no one worries. I don't worry about bills in August. In August, I don't like send me bills. I don't care. Fucking here's your check. Not a problem. Plenty of money in the bank in August. Well, right now it's January. Let me tell you, I'm afraid to look in the mailbox. Right. Um, it ain't it ain't so wonderful now. 
you know, unfortunately I had the discipline and stuff in August not to like spend all my money because I know I'm going to need it during those six months of bleeding that I'm about to go through to get back to May. Um, and so step by step, season by season, we need to feed our next season, right? By getting people to bring us more people in each of those seasons and we don't necessarily need attractions, right? We need activities. We need activities. That's why I think birding is the first step. Because it's activity, it's there. The birds are here. Right? The birds are better in January than they are in August. And, and the way I see it. You know, I mean if you understand like their plumage cycles, right? So breeding plumage is a lot prettier than fall plumage. And that's what they're doing over the winter is, you know, one they're cold and they gotta build new feathers, and two, they're about to like go to the club and put on their groove to get their mates. So they're looking their best as we enter the springtime, and seeing that right now is spectacular. And birders know that. I'm going to get more into like birders at a category of tourists. And frankly, everything points, all the research, all the studies done, they're the most valuable tourists to have. Particularly if you're trying to build a portfolio of ecotourism. Oof, I've really gotten off track of my talking points for this video you know, I've gone and gone into rants I was hoping it would be a pep talk I hope it was a pep talk if it wasn't a pep talk comment below and say dude you really depressed me by saying this right or that depressed me or I was kind of feeling peppy till that. Or I want to feel peppy, but I need to know more about X. You know. So I know in this video, I haven't really gotten into the hows. You know, this video is more about the whys. Why are we magical? Why does that matter? Right? We're magical because we inspire humanity. The waterfall inspires humanity. They expect us to give them inspiration. Right. So as we imagine how we create a portfolio of eco-tourist activities for our guests, we should be thinking about how we inspire them. And what does inspiration mean? What, 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 what does that mean to be inspired? When you're inspired, you, you're motivated to take more action based on this source of inspiration. Right. So if you're inspiring people with a portfolio of eco-tourist opportunities, you're inspiring them to go back and apply concepts in their own home, right? in their own country, in their own communities. Well, how do we live more healthily? How do we live prosperously with a lower carbon footprint? Don't we need to like burn carbon throughout the atmosphere to actually have energy and, and eat crops? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, and I'm here to tell you, probably not. I mean, that's what really the science is telling us. You know, it's, it's wholly unnecessary to use herbicides. It's wholly unnecessary to use pesticides to protect our crops and fungicides to protect our crops. It's wholly unnecessary to till. But the way we have built up our agricultural industry as a species, and it's not just America, it's the whole planet, the whole species is doing it or has it done it. It's all unnecessary. Um, but n the way we've done it did get us to 7.2 billion people, and that's a lot of miles to feed, and there is a certain amount of risk and a certain amount of habituation to how we're doing it, so you just can't turn the light off on these industrialized agricultural practices. But we've got a, a green revolution, and that's what the green revolution is going to begin be about. It's going to be about deindustrializing and naturalizing our agricultural processes in a way that still feeds 7.2 billion people and has the potential to feed 14.4 billion people because obviously our population is going to double before it crumbles. Um, I anticipate it will double before it crumbles. And, and, it, it, and it probably won't crumble. Right? I'm saying it won't crumble because the Green Revolution is coming. The Green Revolution is going to help us as a species continue to grow in a prosperous manner 
feed ourselves and have less of a negative impact on the planet at the same time and still have the energy we need to do all the other stuff that we do, like travel to Niagara Falls from Timbuktu or vice versa. So I hope that motivates you. I hope you're excited about this green revolution. I hope you're excited to be a part of it. You know, and I more than that, I hope you're starting to see how Niagara Falls is this magical place, this inspiring place, this natural place that is already permeated the entire consciousness of humanity has it's just a natural place to spur that revolution and it's not like we haven't spurred revolutions before you know in the past the electrical revolution if you want to call that like that thing that happened in the middle of the industrial revolution inspired humanity it started here essentially right that's why we have a statue of tesla on goat island Right? I mean, and that's the sad thing. We didn't build the statue to Tesla, you know. Yugoslavia built the statue to Tesla and gifted it to us, right? A country that doesn't even exist today. I mean, it, 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 uh, you know, I mean, I would go off on another tangent and just about the, the quirkiness of the history behind that statue, right? And, and the irony of, you know, the country that truly honored Tesla here in Niagara Falls is a country that doesn't even exist today. Um, wow. 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 Wow, Niagara. So, in the last episode, I talked and Gabe shared a little story about my rusty blackbird incident, and I showed you some uh, bird photos. And I don't think I really showed you the rusty blackbird. So here at the end of the video, I'm going to show you the some of the photos I did capture of the rusty blackbird in Joseph Davis State Park this past fall. And uh, until next time, be inspired, Niagara.